is brought to you by your cable or satellite provider. Washington Journal continues. Joining us, Representative Bill Pascrell, Democrat of New Jersey, a member of the Ways and Means Committee. Good morning to you. Hey, Joe. Good to see you again. On the topic of taxes, sir, Kevin Hassett is the White House uh, Council of Economic Advisors chairman. He says this about the past tax cuts from Republicans, saying as of April 8th, nearly 500 American employers have announced bonuses or pay increases, affecting more than 5.5 million American workers as a result of the passage. Goes on to talk about Walmart's impact, says eventually that for someone working 40 hours a week, they may be getting up to $3,000 a year in additional pay. He sees benefits of what was passed. How would you react to that? I would say uh, those figures are very interesting. Uh, but the, the two last reports that I've seen on the impact, and it's early, we understand that, uh, of the tax cuts that were passed by the Republican Party and signed by the president, is that it's a far cry from what they professed, $4,000 per uh, filer, that isn't going to happen, it doesn't look like. Uh, second, uh, we know that most of those dollars, 83% went to higher income uh, folks in the United States of America, and interestingly, most of that money went to either those folks who hold shares in these companies. Uh, this is not a middle-class tax cut by any stretch of the imagination. Another trickle-down deal, uh, which I do not accept whatsoever, since I believe in trying to help those who need the help most. Uh, when it comes to then what you're seeing in your state, right. is there any indication of how New Jerseyans are reacting? Well, we, got, we got slaughtered uh, in this legislation when they did away with the local and state tax deduction of over $10,000. The average a property owner in New Jersey is paying taxes about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars in that range, and so that deduction. By the way, Pedro, that deduction goes back before the code in the twenties, the tax code. It goes back to the Civil War, and if you look at the origin of why this deduction was so important, and now it's helped so many people, is that we were concerned during the Civil War that most of the money would go to the federal government to be used in the war to protect America and its, and its values. And then there'd be no money left for local roads, hospitals, whatever the case may be. It was a good move. Uh, this, to me, was probably the worst part of the tax cuts that were passed you can ask, last year. You can ask questions of our guests by calling 202-748-8001 for Republicans, 202-748-8000 for Democrats and Independents, 202-748-8002. The administration has billed as paying for these ca tax cuts depending on growth in the United States, predicting 3% growth over many quarters. Yeah. Do, you, do you see that kind of math happening? Absolutely not. I, th I believe that this was a setup to get into what they really want to do, and that is cut Medicare and Social Security. We've already seen those cuts in Medicaid, which is very, very important, not just to the poor. We have very little idea what Medicaid really pays for and who gets the benefits when they're needed. So I would say that's, uh, that it's not going to pay for itself. And if you just saw the latest report, we're talking about $2.3 trillion added to the debt. And we are, Democrats, we are the ones that tax and spend I think we got it a little bit backwards. One of the issues, and even as of yesterday, you made this still an issue, was what about Donald Trump's uh, tax returns and what you'd like to see happen. I'm glad you brought that up, Pedro. It's tax day. It's been extended, of course, for another day. Um, I think that uh, the country has a right. People have, a know, have to know if there are any potential conflicts. And since Donald Trump, the president of the United States, we only have one president at a, at a time, his money's been invested in over 50 countries, 500 properties. Uh, we don't know anything about it. Uh, we're not talking about a 1040 form that we want to look into. We're talking about thousands of pages that go with your business doings and your dealings and the debt that you've incurred over these years to find out really where the president stands on these issues. And there's been numerous reports on how since he raised his hand and became the president, that there are potential conflicts, whether it's his property, his hotels, his golf courses. And so I think we have a right to know that. Why in, 20, in, in 2014, when the Republicans looked in, if you remember Lois Lerner, she was the head of the IRS, 
and they used 1603D, which was part of the tax code, which was a result of the big scandal in 23, 1923 of Teapot Dome. Remember that from grammar school? The nuns pushing that into my head, and I never forgot it. And I, I read about it as much as I could, and here again it pops up as a member of Congress. That was the reason why that part was put in, to protect people's privacy. But on the other hand, there are three committees in the Senate and the House that can go into someone's taxes, can't make them public unless it is voted upon by either the Ways and Means Committee, uh, a Senate Joint Committee on Taxation, and there's uh, the, tra the uh, Financial Committee. So we got three committees that have the right to look into it. They, def they use this 6103 to go into Lois Learners, uh, not, not to our tax account, but then they went into almost 50 other accounts to show that the IRS was trying to show the IRS was targeting mm -hmm. conservative groups, which, of course, nothing ever came out of it. Uh, so it's good for Goose. It's good for the gander as well. And we're going to get those tax returns. If we don't get it, the Congress of the United States, in using a checks and balance system, which the forefathers were smart enough to put in there, then maybe Mr. Mueller will get them. Uh, we'll go to our first call for you. It comes from Illinois, Republican line. Bob, you are on with our guest, Bob Pas uh, Bill Pasquale of New Jersey. Go ahead. Morning, Bob. How do you feel there are pros and cons about making the uh, tax cut permanent for the people? Yes. Uh, well, what they're doing now, because they got a tremendous pushback, because it's permanent for corporations, as you know, Bob, but it wasn't made permanent for the middle class and anybody else. Uh, to do it now, to me, is playing catch-up politics. We warned them what was going to happen. This should have been across the board. Why are corporations any more important than individuals? And by the way, there have been enough Supreme Court decisions to show that maybe corporations should be treated as individuals also. They're treated in terms of campaign financing anyway. From Ohio, independent line, Ron, good morning. Good morning. Morning, Congressman. How are you, sir? Uh, my, that's fine, thank you. My question is they lower the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. I did vote for that. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, I'm glad. Well, how much better would it have been to lower it from 35 to 25 or even 24 and put the extra dollars into our deficit or in other programs that we, that we want, to, want to do. Well, that and would be more much more reasonable. Charlie Rangel and myself 10 years ago uh, recommended when we were in the minority uh, that we lower the corporate rate. We, Democrats were not against lowering the corporate rate. That's a lot of baloney. We recommended it be lowered from, 25, from uh, 35 to uh, 28. And I think 25 would have been a reasonable conclusion also. What we've done is put ourselves deeper in debt and we haven't taken care of the middle class. And that's what we need to do in a shrinking middle class in the United States of America. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Connecticut uh, is where Lou is, Clinton, Connecticut, on our independent line. Lou, you're next up. Morning, Lou. Hey, good morning. Uh, I, I, I live in a blue state, and uh, uh, you're a guy from a blue state. And I yes, just sir. want to let you know I'm going to be leaving this blue state this year for a red state. And the reason why is because of what the Democrats have done. The opposition, uh, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, you've killed them. You're killing those states. And you know what? The, the tax, the tax, the fact that the taxes are lower now are going to be a big help. Uh, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the biggest thing. That, and I, I recommend that anybody, and I, I used to be a Democrat, but I'm not any longer. Um, everyone needs to go. To a state that's friendly. The northern blue states are unfriendly to the, the, the taxpayers. Okay. Thank well, uh, I think it was tremendously unjust for blue states to be targeted uh, when they put this tax package together, which, which was not tax reform in any manner, shape, or form, Luke. These were tax cuts for those people in the top 17 percent. Uh, of the economy in the United States of America. And to take away the deductions that the people in Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, New York, Illinois, California used to kind of balance things at the end of the year, I think was a very horrible thing to do. 
These are not reasons why people buy homes, but to have that deduction kept you in your house. And I think it was a very sad thing to do. So look, you're talking about local politics in Connecticut and local politics and taxes in New Jersey, which is a legitimate issue, a legitimate issue. But if the federal government shrinks its responsibilities and does not live up to those responsibilities in helping the states, your taxes are going to go up even more. If the House turns back to Democratic hands in November, is there any strategy as far as reversing the taxes or making changes to the tax code that was passed? I think that it should be revisited. There's no two ways about it. But to do it now, as I said before, uh, to catch up, realize that you made a big mistake and not making it permanent. Because you even perceptually showing people that you cared more about those who have it against those who are trying to make it. So I, I think it's a big mistake right now. I don't think you'd get Democratic cooperation at all at this point. You, they did their thing. Look, they didn't even ask us. How can anybody even question this? We weren't even asked as members of the tax writing committee to be part of the process of coming up with a tax plan. We had no hearings. We had no witnesses. If you remember the last time we did tax reform, real reform, which we had bipartisan support, was in 1984, 85, and 86. From our own state, Senator Bradley uh, was one of those people, uh, Congressman uh, um, uh, Ken, Kent, uh, New York. They were forces, forces that got people to understand we got to do this together. And if one party chooses to do it all by itself, it usually doesn't work out very well. If that changeover does happen in November, it's reported that you're pushing for Joe Crowley, uh, the, the head of the uh, Democratic uh, uh, caucus I think, Joe chair. An, I think Joe would make an excellent uh, speaker. This is not a coup. Uh, I nominated uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, last year. I would do it over again. But the point of the matter is we need to go in a new direction, and I think it's healthy for the party. And I think Nancy even believes that. So whether she'll stay on if we take over the House, I don't know. But there's no coup intended by anybody. Well, when you say new direction, then what do you think has to change within the current direction that the party's going? Well, I think, I think uh, 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 Leader Pelosi did the right thing at the beginning of last year when she opened the leadership up to a lot of younger congressmen that have come in. I think that's a healthy proposition. I think it's been good for the party. But I'm not, we're not only talking about Nancy Pelosi, when we're talking about leadership changes, we're talking about maybe we need a change in terms of the entire brigade of leaders that we have. That doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. Look, they're the poster child for in every election, like Republican leaders are the poster child, and there's nothing you and I are going to do about that. Uh, from California, Republican line, Bob is next. Hi. Hi, how are you doing, gentlemen? Listen, morning, there's an issue that's never, good morning. There's an issue that's never discussed on this. And it's thrown out and then not addressed completely. Now, I've been in the mortgage business. I've retired from it for 35 years. And in that period of time, I have done lending. I have done secondary market. I have sold loans and bulk sale to the secondary market as mortgage-backed securities. And the one thing that has always amazed me, because we talked about the property tax issue, is that states on the East Coast, the property tax will typically outstrip the level of the house payment. So in essence, what the customer is doing is they have a house payment of $800 or $900 a month, but between the local tax, the property tax, the school tax, et cetera, their tax bill is $1,100. Now, they're not getting anything for that $1,100 to speak of. They're paying more in taxes than they are for a house payment. That happened in California back in 1977, and they rolled it back because of Prop 13. You had people who could not afford their houses anymore, not because of the payment, but because of the constant increase in property tax. So the state that taking away the property tax was a disservice, you've got to ask yourself a question. How did the property tax get so high to begin with? Okay. And it's because of underfunded pensions of the labor unions. Okay, caller, thanks. Uh, I would agree with your last statement. States did not live up to their obligations to not only unions, but supporting pensions uh, even in the private sector. I think that this is something we need to take a look at. You brought up an interesting point. But when we talk about high-tax states... We need to take a look at each state and why. If you're living in a state that is highly dense population, like the state of New Jersey, and you have a state where you're going to have higher property values, uh, the properties that, that the people that make a higher income 
are usually living in those kinds of states right now. Not, that doesn't mean exclusively. But then you're going to see taxes because the services are needed. You need a different kind of service. I'm not justifying every tax hike. What I am saying to you, every state is different and unique, and that sometimes property taxes uh, are the main means for revenue for that particular state. So you've got to go state by state. That's what you need to do. And by the way, in 2007, 2008, it wasn't simply because of the, the state's taxes that brought down the foreclosures of homes. It was the primary reason is that lenders and mortgage people took advantage of those individuals when we had those member of first-time buyers, and those folks were, get, were saddled with a debt they could never pay. Debt is the basis of what you're talking about, sir, not only in terms of property taxes, but in terms of our retail stores throughout the country. Why do you think uh, Toy, Toys R Us is closing? Because of Amazon or because of some other ridiculous reason? No, it's because they were saddled with too much debt and they couldn't get out of it. That's why. We'll hear from uh, a viewer in New Jersey's neighbor, New York. Anne is next. Democrats line. Uh, yes, I would like to see the Democrats in Congress band together and refuse to vote with Republicans on anything until Mitch McConnell agrees to bring a bill on the floor to protect Mueller and Rosenstein. I think that uh, Mr. Miller needs to be protected. He deserves it. He's a great patriot in America. Uh, however, I don't believe that we're going to serve any long-term purpose by not agreeing on things that we can't agree on. I mean, we need to bring the country together and not separate us further. We polarized it, and, you know, all of us. Uh, and we need to bring us back together because it has an effect, a deleterious effect on the population. That's not healthy. People start to look inward. They don't see the community. Community is critical to solve all our problems just like it's good for Democrats and Republicans to get together. So if the Democrats take hold of the House in November, your thoughts on if impeachment proceedings should start? Well, I don't think we're there yet, but I think it's something we're going to have to take a look at. There are too many conflicts of interest here, too many uh, a, a finger in the eye uh, to the checks and balance system, uh, and I think that this is very critical for us to stand up for. In 2014, I, I referred to this before, Pedro, in 2014, when Republicans uh, uh, who took control uh, of the House and the Ways and Means Committee went after people's individual tax returns, they turned to the very basis of which I'm trying to get the president's tax returns. I think they would be very revealing, and every president since Richard Nixon has done this. We have a right to know if our sitting president is in potential conflict. If when he brings uh, the folks from the Middle East to his hotel in Washington, not that he brings them physically, but they use his hotel, whether his profits there are really in, in coordination with the Constitution of the United States. He was told, this president, to divest himself of what he had invested in. He didn't do this. The ethics commissioner at that time, Mr. Schaub, told him you need to divest. This way you wouldn't have any problems. He chose to stay on. He's still making profits. His family's still making profits. If that isn't an unusual situation, I don't know what it is. We have uh, less than 10 minutes in this segment. Betty, in High Point, North Carolina, Democrats line, you're on. Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my call. Republican pa uh, Representative Pascal, you were asking a question earlier concerning how Medicaid families might be affected by what's going on. Yes. I just had a call last night. I was speaking with my daughter. I have a 16-year-old spe special needs child. She has never, she's, she's been diagnosed as being in the autism spectrum, but she's never had a concrete diagnosis. When she, Her mother has um, did not reach out for any type of assistance until she was five years old. She's never lived in public housing. She or her mother's always managed to find some way to provide for her family. She was telling me last night that um, her Medicaid had been cut. She's a single mom. 
Right. She's taking care of two daughters. Her right. older daughter is uh, in school at uh, our local community college. She works 12 hours a day in a job that was set up for me. She went to that job as a quality control person. But when she realized the difference between her salary and the salary that the men were getting, she went to management and she requested a position that the men held. She's the first woman after many, many years. This is a very old company. It's hard labor. Betty, and, and I don't mean to interrupt you, only for the sake of I time. Yeah, we'll get the, the representative respond. Just, just let me say this. Uh, we get calls in my office about this all the time. Uh, the last budget uh, cut Medicaid by $64 billion. That's on page 34 of the Republican budget. I will never forget that cut because I had so many calls about, we're talking SSI, uh, and, and uh, we're talking about disabilities. Um, there is no question, go back to the question I got a couple of phone calls ago, don't we think that we can get into, you know, doing some things now that was not in the tax cuts to try to go back over it again? This is a disastrous bill which has hurt a lot of people, and yet most of the money from those tax cuts, by the numbers, go to those people who don't need it. Go to those shareholders who don't need it. And this is not a cut for the general common good of the United States of America. If you want to call my office, I don't know which state you're looking in, you call my office, give your name and number, and I will call you back, ma'am. Uh, let's go to Rex. He's in Minnesota, Democrats line. Good morning, C-SPAN. Pedro, I'm a big fan of yours, big fan of C-SPAN. And, Bill, I really much, very much appreciate your frank uh, candor this morning. I think you're a straight shooter, and I appreciate your service to the country Thank you. Uh, in the House. I really do appreciate it. Now, I am somebody who is, I'm not quite an activist, but I am somebody who likes to be able to formulate ideas for my local representatives for how they can go door-to-door in my community north of Minneapolis to say to people, here is the reason why you need to vote Democratic, and then point to this tax sham that was passed in December. I don't want to get into Trump bashing. I want to make sure the facts are set up straight and clear for everybody to understand, and we are in a conservative district. So how would you frame that argument so you point it out in a very genteel yet concrete fashion? You get, you, I think you're, you're on target because you need to talk in a, in a calm manner and have dialogue with those who don't agree with you. But in order to do that, you're wise to say you've got to know the facts of the particular situation and then have that dialogue. Uh, I've never excluded anybody from any dialogue I've ever had, whether it was a town meeting or whatever. I think that that's important. We shut out each other. We say, these people don't agree with me, so the heck with them. No, that's no way to get a resolution of the problem. And if you do that, you're not going to last long. I don't believe you'll last long. Look, we've had examples in New Jersey where some congressmen would not have any town meetings. Uh, people went to their offices and sat in. I don't recommend that, but this is the result of that kind of a thing. I think you're being wise in what you say. And instead of thinking about it as a red district and a blue district, think about it as an American district, which brings you will bring the facts to whenever you have that opportunity. You don't, you're not going to go there to argue. You're going to go there to have dialogue. Uh, another topic uh, on trade real quick. The yes, front sir. page of the Financial Times saying Beijing's open to letting some more automotive trade happen between the two countries. Do you think this is a result of the president's talk on China, and at least when it comes to tariffs or potential tariffs? Well, I think, you know, as the ranking Democrat on trade in the Congress, um, <laughs> you ask a, a loaded question, not, not that you intended to be loaded, but we're talking about negotiations right now on renegotiating NAFTA, renegotiating the Colombian trade deal. We just finished uh, work on the South Korean uh, trade deal uh, and China. Uh, the pre president uh, yesterday, the administration yesterday, refused to uh, say anything about China concerning currency manipulation. We've been on this, Democrats and Republicans, for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Who the heck is he kidding? 
So whether there are, are discussions going on behind the scene so that China, you open up a little here, we won't say anything negative about you there, which would simply be part of the president's style. Uh, you know, he thinks he's doing a business deal every time he talks to you. This is not business. This is government. And we can't run our government because we have a checks and balance system, because these are folks that are democratic, democratically been elected like you do a, bus, a business. We're out stay in business. Uh, last call will be Kelichi from Maryland. We've got just about a minute, so go ahead and make it fast, please. Just real quick, I just wanted to say that um, I was really disappointed by the, uh, the, uh, the congressman's uh, response to the lady about the, uh, the Democrats banding together to protect um, New York, New York. And, it, and it, it's demonstrative of one of the reasons why people don't trust Democrats to leave. They're, when they have the power to actually make some change, they're, they're looking for a compromise, and, and the person they're compromising with Republicans is not looking for a compromise. Okay, so, okay, sorry about that. We'll have to leave it there. Uh, government is the art of compromise. I'm sorry to tell you that, but that's what the America is all about. Doesn't mean that you surrender your values. It doesn't mean you surrender your ideals. It simply means we got to come together and have a resolution of a problem, or else we solve nothing. I will not be an obstructionist to Republicans if we can come together on agreement on, regardless of whether we're talking about education, transportation, or foreign policy. And I think that that's the way to go. And I've been successful with that up until now. Our, rep our guest is Representative Bill Pasquale, a Democrat from New Jersey, serves on the Ways and Means Committee. Thanks for your time this morning. I'm honored, Pedro. Thank you. And that's it for our program today. The House of Representatives just coming in for its business on uh, this short week. We will take you to them.